All right, so before I get started, because I just jumped in, because I'm, I'm excited about this lesson. I got to give honor where honor is due. I got to give honor to our pastors, Pastor Ken and Pastor Tabitha. I mean, let's give a shout out to them. They are so amazing. But not only that, I got to give a shout out to our campus pastor, Pastor Aaron and Ronika, man. I'm telling you, they are amazing people. They are a power couple like a Jay-Z and Beyonce. You hear what I'm saying? I mean, they're powerful, man. I mean, God is doing such a thing in them to lead us, to guide us, to change this city like never before. And so we want to make sure we honor those who are, who are laboring in the Word just for you and I. And so on today, uh, Pastor Aaron and Renika, we honor you. But not only that, <clears throat> I want to give a big shout out to the assistant pastor, all the lay pastors, man, and all the those who are serving in the ministry of help. Man, thank you so much. Listen, without you guys, we wouldn't have cameras. You wouldn't see my beautiful face. Ha! See you. you. I mean, we wouldn't have any of these things, man, but I am so appreciative of everything that you all do for this ministry. But last but not least, I have to save the best for last, my baby mama. You know what I'm saying? Uh, girl, let me, let me come in a specific game to you. Hey. Uh, Listen, I, I got to give honor and thanks to my beautiful wife of 17 years. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's been the best 15 years of my life. The best 15. <laughs> but it's been amazing. And I want to give a shout out to my two kids, Caleb, who is nine, about to be 10, and Victoria, who is seven. Um, I love you all so very much. So today, we are going to be talking about uh, the prayer of Thanksgiving, okay, the prayer of Thanksgiving. Let me ask you a question, and so this is going to be kind of like a survey. I like crowd participation. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you okay with crowd participation? Um, if you don't like it, then come sit on the front, and I'm going to talk straight to you. No, I'm just playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. So this, this, <laughs> have you ever had somebody that you might have gave them a ride somewhere, but they never gave you gas money? Okay. <laughs> Or, 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 or you, you gave them something to eat or money to eat because they didn't have food, right? Or, or maybe they didn't have a place to stay, but you allowed them to sleep on your couch, right? What are those two words that you are expecting to hear when, you, when they do something for you? Oh, y'all knew that too quick. Like, you are what? Expecting that, right? 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 So how does it make you feel? When you do stuff for people, you take them to where they need to go, get clothes, get food, give them shelter, and, and, it's, and it's a sacrifice for you because you need these things, but yet you're willing to give it to them, and they don't say thank you. How does that make you feel? I know for me, I get hot. I, I'm hot. I'm angry about that because let's hold up. You don't have the, the decency to be gracious to say two simple words, which is Thank you. Just that simple. Two simple words. That's all I'm looking for. I don't know. As I'm thinking about this, I got two people that pop in my head like right away. How about you guys? As you're talking about like, oh, yeah. Can I see a, a, a show of hands? This is the survey. How many is like, yeah, I know some folk like that. I got some. They might be sitting next to me. Hey, listen, look straight ahead. Look straight ahead. All right. If you're at home on the couch, look straight ahead. Don't look at your partner, whoever's sitting next to you. Look straight ahead. You hear what I'm saying? I know two people. In fact, I'm going to talk about them. They, those are my kids. Them, doggone. Can I get an amen from those parents out there? Thank you. If your kids are sitting next to you at home, just tell them to go to the other room for this part of the lesson because we're going to talk about them right quick. So, so my kids, we had to go to the doctor's office earlier this week, and me being such a good father, I'm a good, good father, is who I am. Is who I am, right? I'm a good father, right? And so I decided, you know what? Y'all you did well at the doctor's office. You didn't, you didn't act a fool. We didn't act crazy. I'm going to treat you. So I take him to this doggone, God, dog, this doggone coffee shop, right? And we go there, and I said, pick whatever you want. It's on me. It's on me. So what they do? They pick these big, giant cupcakes. I mean, they're, I mean, they're like this big. I'm like, how are y'all going to eat it? But whatever you want, you can get. It's on me. So they pick the two the cupcakes. The lady box them up real nice. She puts them right next to me. As I'm putting my card into the thing to pay, the kids just snatch that thing and walk off. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And so they go, they go sit down. So in my mind, I think, oh, they just wanted to find a seat for us. Okay, that's, that's all right. So I grab my coffee. I come. I sit down at the table. They're looking at me, and I'm looking at them. I'm sitting here. Victoria's here. Caleb is here. They're still looking at me. 
and I'm looking at them. And I'm like, um, uh, what's going on? And they're like, why are you looking at us? <laughs> Have you ever been a parent? And maybe if you're not a parent, this has happened to you, where your parents get so angry that they talk through their teeth, <laughs> where you're not, you, as a parent, you try not to make a scene. Because if you open your mouth, you know, that's going to come out. When you talk to your teeth, it kind of settle it down a little bit. I said, put those cupcakes down. <laughs> and the famous four words that all parents have said, and maybe you've even heard, what do you say? Thank you. Wait, what? Thank you. Thank you? Thank you? You didn't come out $5 for a doggone cupcake? Thank you? In my mind, in my mind, my mind, I didn't do this, but in my mind, I just saw myself picking up those cupcakes and just mash it in their face. Like, you won't, oh, you are going to say, thank, thank you, thank you. That's how I felt. That's how, that's how I felt. Because I was angry. I don't like that. I don't like when people take advantage of me. I don't like when people are ungrateful for what I'm doing for you. That $10, I could have used that. I needed that. You know? And so, okay, maybe, maybe it's not kids. Okay, let's, let's switch it a little bit. Maybe it's traffic. Oh, we got that same reaction <laughs> earlier. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that for a little bit. Have you ever been in traffic so bad where there's somebody that you see up there that needs to just turn into your lane, but nobody's letting them in? But you being the super Christian, God-fearing, God-loving person that you are, you decide I'm going to hold up traffic just for you, even though I'm going to miss this light to get me home quicker, I'm going to slow down and let you in. And once they pull into that lane and they're sitting in front of you, what are you looking for out that back window and out the driver's side window? Show me. Everybody, let me see it. Everybody. In the yeah, even at home, what are you looking for? Yeah, you're looking for that hand. If it's all five, they're really appreciative. It's two, it's like, thanks, bro, appreciate that. Whatever it is, you're looking to come out the driver's side or you want to see that thing in the back. Why? Because, because if you don't, you're teetering on your emotions at that moment. Right? You're teetering. Because they pull out and you don't see a hand, that thing just tilts over to road rage. Just tilts. Because in my head, this is in my head, when people don't do that, I feel like I just want to drive real fast, get in front of them, look at them while I'm passing, hit the gas, hit the brake, hit the gas, hit the brake, hit the brake, just sit there. Hit the gas, hit the brake. I just want to make them so frustrated because I want them to feel what I feel. You on grass. I, I could have been home five minutes early, but I let you in. You see, and you feel angry about that, don't you? Because all you missed was a, a simple wave or a thank you. So I wonder how God feels as us as believers and children of God when we just thank him for the big things, but yet we still don't thank him for the little things. You see, in, in Psalms 9.1, it says this, I will give thanks and praise the Lord with all of my heart. I will tell aloud all your wonders and marvelous deeds. In that scripture, it's saying that we are to give thanks to God and tell everybody, everybody about his wonderful deeds and what he's done in our lives. That's what we're supposed to do. We need to be thankful. <laughs> and the thing is, this lesson really began to work on me as I was working on the lesson. Because I then began to think, well, am I Caleb and Victoria? Am I taking something for granted and thinking I deserve it and not giving thanks? Have I really truly been thankful this whole time and everything that God has done in my life, how he has showed me and kept me and protect me? Have I really been thankful? Have I woken up and said, thank you, God, for waking me up? Or am I waking up and saying, thank you for all the likes and followers I just got overnight? Who liked my, my Instagram post or my Facebook uh, post? Who liked this? Am I giving all the attention and time to the world than to God? I had to sit there and really begin to do some soul searching. Am I really thankful? Or am I just halfway thankful? So I'm hoping this lesson challenges you as it's challenged me to really seek out, have I been truly thankful for everything that God has done in my life? 
And so we're going to go to our springboard scripture in Acts 16, talking about Paul and Silas, because in this story, there is so much we can pull out of it, and that's what we're going to try to do today. So um, Acts 16, verses 25 and 26, this is the message version. It says, along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer, singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners, prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake, a jailhouse rock, I mean, tottered. Um, every door flew open, and all the prisoners were loose just because of a prayer and praise session. So, so sometimes I, I wish that the Bible would give us more detail on what was said in that prayer. Like, what were the exact words that Paul and Silas said that caused God to get up off his throne and show up into their situation? Because if they can do it, I know I could do it. So what was said, it doesn't tell us that. Because in my mind, how do you have the wherewithal to pray? Think about it. Paul and Silas relied on. Not only were they lied on, they were embarrassed and dragged into town before officials. The officials stripped them butt naked. Can I say butt naked? Okay, I said it twice. But butt naked three times. Stripped them, but not only stripped them, they beat them. Have you ever been spanked naked? My mom used to sneak me. I thought I got away with stuff. And as soon as I step out the doggone shower, she right there, pow! I mean, I think I could only imagine. And here you have Paul and Silas drugged, not just to prison, but drugged into a dungeon, a place where it's just basically hopelessness, depression, a place where you are forgotten, a place where they take the keys, lock you up, and throw them away. This is where they're at, and this is where they decide to pray. Pray? If it was me, if I was praying, yeah, I know what I would pray. It would be a prayer of revenge. It would be. I'd be like, Lord... Listen, I'm going to do your will. It'll be the wrong kind of prayer, right? Like, if you let me go, I'm going to call all my boys. You release your angels, we're going to clap back on everybody that hurt us. Let's go. I'll do it in your name, Jesus' name. (laughs) Right? I would have had that prayer of revenge. I would have been angry because I'm locked up. But here's the thing. Many of you all are in prison right now. And it may not be a literal prison like Paul and Silas, but there are things that are binding you. There are things that are keeping you captive. Maybe some of the things that are binding you and keeping you captive is like an addiction. Maybe it's fear, anxiety, worthlessness. Maybe it's a lack of confidence. I don't know what it is, but it's keeping you bound, but it's also keeping your praise and your thanks bound to give to God. And you're in prison, sitting there, hurting, beaten, battered. What do you do in these instances? What do you do in these circumstances? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. It says, in every situation, no matter the circumstance, be thankful and continually to give thanks to God, for this is the will. Somebody say the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So no matter where you are right now in life, you are supposed to give thanks. Now, listen, I'm not saying thank you for the the punishment and everything that you receive. I'm just saying thank you because, just like Paul and Silas, they were still alive. You give thanks to those things that are still good. You hear what I'm saying? You with me? So we, in everything that we do, we need to give thanks. So why should we say a prayer of thanksgiving? I'm going to give you four reasons why. Number one is to honor God. We got to honor God. A prayer of thanksgiving gives us the opportunity to honor God for all that he has done and what he will do in our life. In fact, Psalms 100 says it very well, verses 3 through 4. It says, Know and fully recognize with gratitude that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us, not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Verse 4, enter his gates with a song of and his course with, and be what? To him and bless and praise his name. So for anything we do, the first thing we do to come before God is sing a song of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Now, I don't know if you can sing, but God said, make a joyful noise. So if you sound like my wife in the shower, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. 
sorry, because she sings Whitney Houston and it don't sound like Whitney, it sounds like Bobby. Um, <laughs> I love you. I need a ride home. I need a ride home. I need a ride home. But it says that we are to give thanks to God. Number two, the reasons why we should pray a prayer of thanksgiving is to show dependence on God. You know, the Bible says to lean not onto your own understanding. Why? Because we always fail when we think we know everything. But when we lean on God and depend on God, he will help us through everything. And so in this prayer of thanksgiving, we need to depend on him on everything that he will do in our lives. Number three, why should we pray a prayer of thanksgiving? To aid us in our prayer because the prayer of thanksgiving helps us in every part of our prayer. It helps us come to Jesus. It helps us come, um, come clean with our confessions because we want to have the approval of our Father and get his forgiveness and cleanse us for whatever we've done. That's what a thankful heart will do. But not only that, it will aid you in your praise because once your heart is filled with thanksgiving, everything that comes out of it, that overflows, turns into praise. It will aid. That's why we uh, say the prayer of thanksgiving. And number four, thanksgiving prayer is an inseparable part of the petitionary prayer. Now, listen, these are two separate prayers, a thanksgiving prayer and a petitionary prayer. What's a petitionary prayer real quick? It's a prayer that you're making your request known. Okay, you're, you're requesting something, you're making a plea to God, like, God, please help me in this test. God, I need you in my finances. Please, God, help me. You're making this request. But the thing is, you have to add both of those prayers together for it to actually work. Because the Bible, it says up here, it says in Philippians that we read that when we pray, it says prayer and petition with thanksgiving. So it's like an add-on. Like you want to add a, some fries, if you want to add on, you know, some cheddar bites at Zaxby's, whatever you want, it's an add-on. So you have to add thanksgiving to when you pray, right? And so when you add, if you come to the God without that song of praise or that song of thanksgiving, a lot of times you're coming to God in the wrong motive. But when you add thanksgiving to it, it does something to your heart. It makes it malleable, and you have a different attitude, and that attitude you have is that attitude of gratitude. The attitude of gratitude, which I wish my kids would have had. Like, they, they're working on it, you know, they're working on it because, you know, you come to a point as a parent, it's like, at a certain age, you should know this. I don't have to keep repeating it to you. Am I the only parent that has, because my parents did it to me, and so I, I, now I see what they were talking about, and I can see God saying the same thing about us. You guys are at a certain age right now, you should know this. You should be able to open up your mouth and say, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so back in the day, many people may not know much about this. And if you don't, it's okay. Just play along like you do, okay? And so when I was growing up in my old church in Texas, it was a church called New Mount Zion Baptist Church. And we used to have week midday um, uh, services, whether it be a prayer meeting or a small service. And during the service, the pastor would stop in his lesson once he's finished. He says, hey, at this moment, we're going to take time to give our testimony. And so it turned from a midweek service into a testimony service. Has anybody ever experienced a testimony service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, many are like, I don't even know what that is. Well, I'm about to show you, and, and, and you'll find out here real quick. So, so what happens is, in that testimony service, every time at my church at least, the mother of the house will come up, and she, the mother house meaning the one who's been in the longest, right, will come up and grab the mics, like, Pastor, I got a testimony, right? And so she'll come up to the middle of the stage, and she'll stand there, and they say the same thing. I don't care who it is. I don't care what church you go to. They say the same phrase right before they give their testimony. First, they say, give an honor to God who is the head of my life. And they do the lip, you know, <laughs> to pastors, saints, and friends. And then they go in and say, God is good and all the time. Yes. <laughs> and, and then they... <laughs> And then they would go in their testimony, right? And so she would share something like, very simple, like, I would pray to God because I didn't have groceries. I ran out of groceries, and I didn't have the ability to go get food. But somebody came knocking on my door, a young man with bags of groceries, saying he hear, heard from God to bring groceries to me. And, and I, when, when I didn't have, God provided for me. And she began to kind of do her dance and, and cry and, and celebrate how good God was. And she was sharing, as we saw in Psalms, the deeds, uh, sharing her deeds of how good God was in her life by supplying groceries. But not only was she not celebrating, 
not only was she celebrating, everybody in the congregation just erupts in praise, erupts in thanksgiving because they're celebrating. Like, yeah, girl, I'm coming over for that peach cobbler. I mean, they, they're celebrating with her, and they are excited for her because she got what she needed at the time. Even though they're still going through, they're still celebrating with her because they're thankful that God touched her, and they're like, we next in line. <laughs> Let's look at it in Philippians. Philippians says it like this, being confident of this, that, we, that he who began a work in you will carry it, um, it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Because it's a lifelong process, somebody say lifelong, it is all more important to what? Our what? Along the way. And that's what a testimony service was. It was for everybody to come together to hear the good deeds of how God has been good in somebody's, somebody else's life. And we all celebrated with them in that moment. And I believe God honors those who celebrate with others in their triumphs and how they have overcome. So on today, since I do have the mic, in this point of the service, I think we should have testimony service. Is that okay? And in fact, I'm going to give a bit of my testimony since I got the mic. And it's just bits and parts of my life. I just want to share with you. If that's, is that okay with you? It's not in any type of order, but I just, you know, I just want to do this. I want you to get an idea of what, how it was in their testimony service. Like first, give an honor to God, who is the head of my life. For pastor, saints, and friends, we love you. You know what? God is good and all the time. Amen, amen. And I want to share with you how God has been good to me all these years, how he has been with me and stayed by my side and never let me fail. In fact, God has been with my family like no other. He healed my mother from breast cancer. When the doctor gave her a bad prognosis, he touched her through surgery and no longer is cancer in her body. Thank you, God, for her healing. Even with my children, Caleb, when he was born, the doctors almost had to do an emergency surgery on my wife because the umbilical cord wrapped around his neck two times. So his blood pressure dropped immediately. But instead, he was still coming out. And as he came out, you saw that his face was purple and his body was getting discolored because there was no blood circulation happening. And once they relieved that pressure off his neck, his, his color came back. And their concern was whether or not he would have damage in his brain from the lack of blood that was going. But I am here to report to you today that my son is... It's in an honor roll. He's doing well. His mind functions just good. And I thank God that he is here and still alive. Even my little girl when she was young, she had an infection in her chest. She had to get two surgeries because they got it out once and then they came back again. And the doctor said that her mammary tissues would not come back and she wouldn't be able to nurse or do anything or she would be a little bit disformed on this side. But, but through prayer and supplication and trusting in God, we laid hands on my little girl and the doctor says her mammary tissues are just fine and she would just be a healthy little girl and a healthy mother when she has children. Come on, that's when you celebrate break for healing. I don't know if you need healing, but this is the opportunity to jump in, even online. My wife, my wife, my God, my wife. There was a moment a few years ago that she was at a stoplight and it turned green. If she would have left that stoplight a few seconds earlier, she would have been T-boned on the driver's side. And that accident would have took her life and possibly her passenger's life taking the, the mother away from their kids and, the, and a wife away from me, but God sent his angels to protect her to where she was able to swerve and be able to get hit in the front side. And I'm here to tell you, I am thankful for my wife. I'm thankful that God has kept me. Many people don't know my story, but I'm going to share just a little bit with you. I came from an angry house. My father was an angry man. And it, since he was so angry, he would take his anger out on me and my mother physically and verbally. And I was in an abusive house. And there was one time my dad wanted to get back at my mother for just being who he was. He kidnapped me away from my mother. And as we're driving off, I don't know where I'm going. I know I'm with this man. God knew that if I was to stay, I either would die or I would wait. I would come up in a very, very battered home. And so my mom called the cops. 
And I have to thank God that God opened, eye, opened the eyes of the cop who was on duty on the side of the road to recognize the car that was coming by. He turns on his lights. He pulls over my father. He gets more back up back there. And now I am pulled away from abusive relationship and I'm placed back with my mother. And here I am as I stand before you, as, an, as a, a lay pastor here at Alive Church, that I am able to speak and share the goodness of God with each and every person. That's a little bit of my testimony. See, you can have testimony service all by yourself. You don't need a crowd. Go home and start giving God thanks. You begin to remember how good he's been to you. See, the prayer of thanksgiving isn't about you praying it right after the situation. It's praying while you're in it. I'm not saying praying for the bad things that are happening, but pray for the good things that are happening for you. Do you hear what I'm saying? The prayer of thanksgiving. Listen, <clears throat> here's Paul and Silas. They're sitting in a jail cell. They're bleeding. They're out of breath. And all I can think is when they're praying, they're praying this prayer of thanksgiving because they're still alive. And so the Bible says to pray in every circumstance, right? Yet even though they were beaten and taken advantage of, but they're praying for their life and that they're able to have breath to continue to pray. And they're praying this prayer of thanksgiving in the cell. And the Bible says, when you pray in every circumstance, it's God's will. And I truly believe the reason why God came off his throne and showed up into their situation because they were doing God's will in that situation. How many of you are allowing this situation to keep you bound and locked up and not allowing you to give thanks? See, you can see here what Paul and Silas, when they began to give thanks to God, God moved. Do you want to know how you can be freed from that? That's just by you opening up your mouth mouth and giving God thanks for all that he's done. In fact, you know what? I'm going to give you five. No, I'm going to give you 10 seconds, 10 seconds to place something on your mind. If you want to stand up, you can sit down, whatever's comfortable. I want you to give God thanks for what he has done in your life because he has done so much in 10. Come on. And nine. God, I thank you. Hey, come on. Seven, six at home. Get up and stand up. Give God thanks for what he has done. Four. Come on. Three. He's been good to you. Two and one. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's been good. He's been good. You all can be seated. Listen, those are moments you could take anywhere, even at work, go in the bathroom. Thank you, God, I didn't have to lay hands on them because it was about to go down. I mean, wherever you are, you take this prayer of thanksgiving with you. You are the church. Take it with you. And so Paul and Silas said this prayer of thanksgiving. And God showed up. How did he show up? He showed up as the earthquake, where he shook the ground. When he shook the ground, those things that were locked were now open. Those things that were binding the prisoners were now loose, and these men were free men. God showed up, and I believe God would do the same for you. And so <laughs> I truly believe that, that, God, that God really wanted to free Paul and Silas. I do. I really believe that he wanted to do that. But I think he had a side, a side agenda. And so I'm going to take a little diversion, but I'm going to bring us right back. But his side agenda was for the one, the one. I, I really believe he needed that to happen with Paul and Silas so he can get the attention of the one. You see, God is big on the one. Think about it for a second. In Jesus' ministry, there was a point in time where he went into a well and wanted water. And he asked this woman, hey, can you give me some water? And while she's giving him some water, he's telling her all her business. I know who you slept with. I know who you with right now. I mean, he was going all into her grill, this woman at the well. This one woman goes into a city, a town of hundreds of people, and begins to say, hey, there's a man who knows all my business, and you got to go see him. And within hours, maybe, maybe hours or minutes, the whole town empties. And they go up to the well where Jesus was. And they surround Jesus. And Jesus is able to speak and talk about the kingdom of God. Why? Off of the one. The one. The one. See, the Bible even says this in Matthew. It says, what do you think? Matthew 18, 12, and 14. It says, what do you think if a man owns 100 sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go look for the one that wandered off? 
And when and if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones shall perish. He's all about the one. So this earthquake is going. Here is a guard who is tired. He's sleepy. He had to hear Paul and Silas sing off tune. You know what I'm saying? Sound like Bobby Brown, you know, and not Whitney, but Bobby. You know what I'm saying, Jay? Um, And so he's tired, so he's sleeping, and this earthquake shakes him. Not only did it shake him, it shook something on the inside of him. Because when he opens his eyes, he sees that the gates are open and everybody is loose. So he's like, oh, they gone. They gone. So if I report this, I'm already a dead man. So I'm going to go ahead and just do it myself. So the Bible says he pulls out his sword and he turns it on himself and he's about to take his life. But, but out of the darkness, Paul and Silas say, hey, we are still here. Do not do it. And this man, I can just see him, just drops his sword, sword out of just being shocked because he heard them in the darkness, but yet he couldn't see them. God has been speaking, you, speaking to you in your darkness, but yet you can't see the evidence of what he's trying to do. And what I'm trying to tell you today is just be patient. Follow that voice that says, hey, come to me all that is heavy laden. You know what I'm saying? God is really ready to relieve you of that burden. And so this soldier runs and he grabs the, the torch and he's walking down. Everything is lighting up and he sees Paul and Silas loose. He sees all the prisoners loose and it, it just something inside him starts to boil up. He says, the person or who you were praying to and singing to, listen, he drops to his knees. What must I do to be saved? Because I want to experience the lifestyle you're experiencing, have the same results that you're experiencing. What must I do to be saved? And the Bible says in that moment that the, that the jailer took, him to the, take, took Paul and Silas to his house. Now, I think he locked everybody else up. He's like, I ain't going to jail for you. Y'all going to get locked back up to get an extra security. But I'm going to take these two with me. They with me. And so first, that jailer going in was their enemy. Now coming out and being transformed and saved, now he's their friend. Maybe a lot of the enemies that are around you are supposed to hear your testimony. The Bible says we overcome by the blood and the word of our testimony. And maybe they need to hear your testimony become from an enemy to come to a friend. Because our testimony is their ability to share the good deeds of what God has done in our lives. And so this soldier takes them over to the house and he sits them down. He says, man, I got you. He starts cleaning their wounds. The Bible says. In fact, he says he gives them new clothes and he sits them down so they can eat a good meal. I mean, they have, I don't know, some, some rice and peas, some oxtail, some cornbread, collard greens. I don't know what they ate, but that sounds good to me right now. And so they're eating and I could just see Paul and Silas sitting there sharing their story like, man, you won't believe what they did to us. I mean, we say this girl, she had the wrong spirit. And we said, and they put us in jail. And I could see that Roman soldier running out from the back of the room and say, hold up, let me tell you my part. See, the God that I just now received in my life shook the earth, opened all these doors that were locked and broke the chains off the prisoners, and they could have been free because of these two men praying and praising our Lord and Savior. It just happened. I didn't know what happened, so I decided to give my life to him. I decided to follow the same God that they follow because I see how good he is. That's the life of thanksgiving. I do believe they said a prayer of thanksgiving. And, and here's the thing. What, who's missing your testimony? Because you are so involved with what you're going through that you have yet to open up your mouth to give thanks to God. Who is the one, the one you're missing that can affect the town? The one you're missing, like the soldier who now has his whole family accepting Jesus Christ or God as their Lord and Savior. Who is the one? See, this is the opportunity where you begin to be like, you know what? No matter my situation, no matter what I'm going through, I'm going to still give you thanks, not for the bad things, but for all the good things that you are doing in my life. Why? Because it's God's will. God's will. God's will. So here's the thing. I want to give you two next steps. They're very simple. Two next steps. Number one, we need to build a memorial. Build 
a memorial. What is that? It's just um, building something that will remind you of how good God has been and how he brought you through. It's just whatever that is to you. In Joshua, Joshua 4, in fact, it, it talks about how Joshua built a, 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 a memorial to God. See, when the children of Israel were, were traveling after battle and everything, they would go to this place called Gilgal. And they had to cross this river, the River Jordan. This river ran deep, and the, the current was super strong. So if you went in it, you would get swept away. And so God gave them a plan. He says, send the priests with the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant held the Ten Commandments, and it was considered the presence of God. And so, and so these, uh, these priests were walking towards the, the edge of the river, and as soon as they began to put their foot in the water, the river began to separate. And they walked in the middle of the river and stood there until every um, uh, child of Israel came across that river. And so Joshua saw how good God was right then and there. And he says, hey, Get one representative from every tribe. That's 12. He says, get them. Now, don't get a pebble. Don't get a skipping rock. I want a boulder, a big rock that you have to carry on your shoulders and bring it right here to the middle of the river. And so these 12 representatives came with these boulders and rocks on their shoulder, and they placed 12 rocks in front of the ark, in front of the presence of God, to show him that we will never forget the hand of God that opened him, opened up this river for us to cross to get to the other side. The hand that's powerful, the hand that's with us. We would never forget it. And every time they went back and forth across that river and that thing would pull away, they would always see that memorial. Like, God, I thank you because you're still doing it. And he's still doing it today. So we need to build a memorial for God. I don't know what that looks like for you. For me, you know, I, I, just, I just look at my kids and I remember what I come, came from. And I promised myself I would never become that with my children. That if I was angry, I would talk. I would open up. I would share. That's a whole marriage thing right there. But that, that's, that's who I was. I didn't want that for them. My memorial. What is yours? And this leads me to number two. Number two, we need to begin to live a lifestyle of thanksgiving, a lifestyle of gratitude. How does that work? Well, the best way I can explain it is through a conversation with my wife's parents, my in-laws. And so they're Jamaican, you know, for all my Jamaican people out there. Bo, 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 yaka, holla. Um, uh, I, I just want to say what's up. And, um, and, so, and so with her family, they have these Jamaican sayings. I have no clue what they're talking about. And, and, and they say it so fast, sometimes I don't pick it up. Like, for instance, I was talking to her mom, and um, I think her dad might have said, but it might have been her mom. And they go off and say something like, cockroach have no business in foul backyard. That's the same look? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm quiet. I'm looking around the table. Her dad is like, mm-hmm. Jess is like, mm-hmm. I'm like, um, how does that help me with my taxes? Like, where did that come from? Like, what does that even mean? Cockroach had no business in foul. What? what? Yeah, so basically, I don't know where she got it from. I think she just felt like she had to say a saying. It means if you're a cockroach, you don't need to be in a, a foul backyard, chicken's backyard, because they eat cockroaches or something like that. And I'm like, uh, that didn't have nothing to do with my taxes, but thank you for sharing. Thank you. And so there's one saying that actually stuck with me. And so we were doing something. She says, one, one, cocoa, make basket. <laughs> so again, what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. translation, please. Um, can I buy a vowel? Um, and so one, one, cocoa, make basket. And so what she explained to us, because we were talking about finances, was she was saying, hey, so in Jamaica, a lot of coconuts fall from the palm tree, and people will be out there with baskets. And she would say they will pick up a coconut, one coconut at a time. So one, one cocoa make basket. And the more you continue to pick up one coconut at a time, it eventually fills the basket. And now you have a full basket of coconuts. And I said, that actually makes sense. It's better than your other saying, right? <laughs> and, so, and so I took that same principle and we can apply that same thing here. When you want to live a lifestyle of thanksgiving, you got to start small. Just thank God for, for waking you up this morning. Thank you, God, for food and shelter. Thank you, God, for being there when no one else was there. Thank you, God, for showing up. Thank you, God, for getting me through my depression. Thank you, God, for saving my wife, my kids, and myself. Thank you, God, for a loving family. Thank you, God, for my shoes. Thank you, God, for my attitude. Thank you, God, for my hair. It look good today. I mean, you got to begin to thank God. And the more thankfulness that you begin to pour into your heart, it now will become full. And what pours out is a lifestyle of thanksgiving. 
One, one cocoa equals a basket. You ain't going to forget that. You hear what I'm saying? So as I was doing that, those are certain things you can pray about in a prayer of thanksgiving. It's not hard. This is between you and God. It doesn't have to be something deep. It can just be very simple just like that and how grateful you are to God. Let's start waking up with the first 15 and giving God thanks. You know, getting the word, pray, give him thanks, and then, you know, spend time um, worshiping him. The first 15, that's kind of one of our things that we do here at Alive Church. I mean, get on the, 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 the uh, um, what is it, the Zoom call for our corporate, corporate prayer time at 8 a.m. If you want to come with people Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at Gainesville location. Let's get started living this lifestyle of thankfulness because I'm telling you, when I did this lesson, it changed my whole perspective. I woke up this morning, thank you, God. I just said thank you, and I didn't know what I was saying thank you to, but I just want to say thank you because I can't say thank you enough. Because I know in my life I, I've been short of thank yous for God because I just allowed life to carry me away. So we got to live this lifestyle of thankfulness. So today I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And what we're going to do, I have this prayer that I want us to pray. Um, so you can have a better understanding of a prayer of gratitude or a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, this prayer is not the end all of prayers. You make it your own, but this is just an example. But I want you to put God on your heart right now. I want you to put the thing that he has brought you through on your heart right now. I don't want you just to say this prayer just to say it. I want it to mean something to you. I want it to really get down into your soul. You hear what I'm saying? So we're going to read this prayer together, and, we're gonna, and I'll start it off. And it says this, Dear God, Thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessing over us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times. Strengthen us for your right. Thank you for your great love and care. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you that you are always with us and will never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we may have freedom and life. Forgive us for when we don't thank you enough for all that you have given. Help us to set our eyes, renew our spirits, fill us with your peace and joy. We love you. We need you this day and every day. We give you the praise of thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give thanks to God? Can we give thanks to God? And that there is just a simple prayer of thanksgiving. You can do it anywhere you want. So with you all still standing, with every head bowed and every eye closed, this is an opportunity for those who can give the ultimate thanks where you finally accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior because God sent his only begotten son to die for you and I. I mean, we couldn't do it on our own. That's why he sent his son to do it because the cost was too heavy. The cost was too much that he gave it all, all of our sins, our, our past, our present, our future sins and placed it on Jesus so he died for our sins. If you have never said the prayer of salvation, this is your opportunity to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And in that, if that's you today, I'm asking that you would just hear from Holy Spirit and lift your hand in the air at this time if you want to say that prayer and give your life to Jesus. I see that hand. You can put it down. Yeah. Listen, we are a family, and we'll say this prayer of salvation together. So repeat after me. Say, Dear God. Forgive me of my sins. I turn to you fully. I am 100% yours. Lead me, guide me. In Jesus' name, amen. And for those who accepted Jesus Christ, welcome to the family, guys. Hey, and remember to live a life of thanksgiving. Be blessed. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. 
All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, it'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.